going to invite you to uh, take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 is our text. Uh, we're continuing our study on the good life. And if you are in the room and you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 962. You'll be able to follow along with us in Matthew chapter 5. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. We're serious when we say that. We really want you to take one home with you. If you'll read it, if you want to learn what God has to say, then please take it. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then let us know. We'll get you one. We're serious about that. Go ahead and call our bluff. We'll mail it to you or deliver it to you. We want everyone to have a Bible, read the Bible, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, what did you see when you came in today? If you're walking in the, in the main entrance, what, what, what did you see when you came in? Because there's all kinds of stuff out there, right? Yeah, you guys saw the baskets. I'm glad that you guys were paying attention. So, you know, the, the, the baskets, by the way, are for uh, Calvary Christian Academy, our school. Uh, we have a gala next week. It always cracks me up when I say gala. It's way too fancy a word for me. So we're having a party next week. And, uh, and by the way, thank you. It's sold out. So if you want to go, too bad. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But on the other hand, uh, they got these baskets out there, and you can win a basket. So if you want to support CCA and you couldn't buy a raffle, uh, raffle you couldn't buy a, uh, a gala ticket, and it, you, but you want to win some stuff, you're feeling lucky. Just go out there, uh, buy some tickets, and support CCA that way because uh, it's a great ministry, and it's going to bless uh, the kids. And we're looking, at, we're exploring the possibility of a high school in the future. So uh, if uh, you... Uh, Mild excitement. Uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, if you would like to support and if you want to cha have a chance to win some, it'll, you know, turn your kids loose. They'll tell you the ones to put it in. Uh, so, uh, and, and just so you know, it's not fixed. I've never won anything. So, uh, and not, not in our uh, gala anyway. So, hey, when you look around, what do you see? I'm glad you guys noticed the baskets. Uh, I'm glad you weren't oblivious to that. If you were oblivious, then uh, take a second look when you get out there. But, but what we see matters. Like, for instance, what do you see on, on the screen here? We're going to put it up there in just a minute. What do you see in this picture? And No, I know. Right there. There we go. Okay. So what do you see? You don't have to tell me. Just go ahead and take a look at it for a moment. And what do you see? So how many of you see, you guys at home, you guys need to do this too. How many of you guys see an old woman? Okay, a lot of you do. How many of you see a young woman? And more of you see the young woman than the old woman. That's interesting. How many of you see both? Okay, how many of you see neither? <laughs> well, it could happen. You know, you don't know. See, now that's fun. Okay, and I hope you like those kind of things. If not, if you do, you can look them up online. But, uh, but some of you are going, what does that have to do with Jesus or living the good life? Well, I want you to know that our heart impacts our vision. Our heart impacts our vision. We're in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5. You guys are supposed to be memorizing these along uh, week by week. So it begins with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied or filled, is how I learned it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And this week's text, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Our heart impacts our vision. And I think this is the beatitude with the coolest promise. Okay, just for me, you know, the others are all great, but the, the fact that Jesus says, if you want to see God, then have a pure heart. I mean, that's a really cool challenge. So, do you want to see God? Yes. Yes. Then have a pure heart. Okay, well done. No. Um, <laughs> see, we need a pure heart. If we want to see God, we need a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And, and that's a problem. It's a huge problem. See, we have a heart problem. Uh, now, our world, our world that we live in, loves the idea of the heart, Right? You know, because we, we talk about it in such romantic terms. 
Because we, we look at people and go, they have a heart of gold, which would mean they were dead. But uh, anyway, I'm going to be literal about it. But they have a heart of gold. You know, and then I can't ever do this. So I heart you. Right? It's, everybody's like, so, oh, I heart you. I love you with all my heart. And the worst advice on the planet, listen to your heart. Follow your heart. The Bible talks about our hearts as well. Now, Jesus challenged us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. A totality of our being. Everything that there is. Uh, but the Bible says a whole lot more about it. Like the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17 said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick or wicked. Who can understand it? That's encouraging, isn't it? The heart, your heart, my heart, is deceitfully wicked above everything, deceitful above everything else and desperately wicked. Yay. And then Jesus in Matthew 15, if you want to flip over a few pages, you can look it up, but he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. You know, with Jesus and Jeremiah's description, I'm pretty sure I don't want you to heart me. <laughs> I don't want anyone to heart me. That's what it is. See, our hearts are naturally deceitful and wicked. And by the way, that's why we talk about experiencing a life-changing relationship with Jesus because we all need Jesus to change our hearts. I mean, hopefully that's why you're here. And if you were dragged here by someone else, then uh, we want Jesus to change your heart too. So, do um, you guys still want to see God? Yes. Okay, good. Well, then we need a pure heart. So let's do a heart check. Let's do a heart check. And you guys are like, uh, okay, uh, what does that look like? Well, the Apostle Paul, in writing to one of his protégés, a guy named Titus, in the first chapter, said, I love this, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Both their minds and consciences are defiled. To those who are pure in heart, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled, everything's defiled. Right? Did you get that? I mean, it's kind of a pretty clear statement. And, and when we hear that, I know for, for me personally, but probably for most of us who were raised in church, it's so easy to think, oh, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled, nothing is pure. So easy and tempting to think about those awful, unbelieving people, those terrible, defiled, disgusting perverts. It's tempting, isn't it? But the heart is deceitful above all else, right? Which means that our hearts are lying to us if we think that that description is for them and not for us. You see, we tend to judge others and we give ourselves a pass. Why? Because we have good hearts. No, we don't. Our hearts are deceitful above all else. Desperately wicked. I mean, that, that's us that is talking about. So uh, let's do a spiritual heart checkup. Remember, Jesus is the great physician. And so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to ask you some questions, talk about some tests that I want to encourage you to apply to yourself. And really, the test isn't for your neighbor. It's not for me to, to know your results. The only results that matter are the results between you and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead. You've made a commitment to follow Jesus. God the Holy Spirit is in you, and so he's going to do this heart check with you. And, and so, here's the thing. Your heart is deceitful above all else. So if you're lying to yourself, the Holy Spirit will call you on it. So you can lie to me. doesn't matter. I'm pretty gullible because I'm an optimist. Okay? So you can lie to me. It doesn't matter. You can lie to the people around you. They know you're lying, but, you know, because they know you. But you can't lie to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't do you any good anyway. So, uh, by the way, this will hurt if you're honest. So the first test is the pressure test. The pressure test. Jesus said, out of the heart come evil thoughts and actions. You can go back and read them again from Matthew 15 if you want. Uh, it's what comes out of a person that defiles him or her. And most of us 
can manage to look godly and act righteous when everything is fine. Right? When everything's going well. But the test is this. How do you act when life squeezes you? How do you respond when your plans fail? When your dreams are crushed? When you lose? When you don't get your way? How do you respond? I mean, on the simple level, when you're driving and someone cuts you off, how do you respond? It's not a lot of pressure, but how do you respond in that moment? Um, you know, look, I know how my uh, one-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter responds when she doesn't get her way. I know how my four-year-old grandchildren respond when they don't get their way. Uh, that's somewhat expected. But how do you respond when you don't get your way? When the life squeezes you, what comes out of you? What do other people around you experience when you're under the pressure test? Do they experience anger, rage, bitterness, blaming, deceit, defensiveness, or cursing? Or do they experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? What, what do people encounter with you when life really squeezes you? Because it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Um, if you're not sure how to answer this, then it really just look at it this way. How long has it been since you really lost it on somebody? Since you went off on them in anger and a tirade and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, that, that may help you figure out. So how does your heart do with the pressure test? The next test that you ought to give yourself is a celebration test. Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul challenges us, believers, to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. In other words, when people are happy and they're celebrating victory, you should celebrate with them. And when they're grieving a loss, you should grieve with them. That's what a healthy heart does. But a defiled heart often reverses it. Um, in other words... Uh, of a defiled heart envies those who are celebrating. Should be me, not them. I should have won, not them. They should have drawn my name out of the basket. Oh, well, it's assuming you're going to lose. Uh, I should have gotten the promotion. I deserve the recognition. How come I'm not up on stage? Why didn't they ask me to give my testimony? Oh, yeah, I told them no. Um, why didn't they? See, when we begin to do that towards other people, it reveals a heart that is not celebrating with other people's victories. And then, a defiled heart often rejoices at others' misfortune and tragedies. Oh no, we know well enough not to do it out loud. Right? We don't do it publicly. We don't ever rejoice at other people's misfortune publicly. But sometimes there's that little smile on the edge of our mouth kind of going, oh, that's terrible. And inside we're thinking, it couldn't happen to a better person. <laughs> right? See, that, that reveals that we have a heart problem in that moment. So how does your heart score on the celebration test? And then there's the speech test. Yeah, the speech test. Jesus in Matthew 12 and, and here's the thing, he's talking to religious people when he says this. And these religious leaders had accused him, Jesus, of having a demon. So they committed what was often called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so he's, he's pretty ticked at this point. He says, you brood of vipers. So you can tell he's ticked when he says that. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Jesus said our words reveal our hearts. Let me say that again. Jesus said our words reveal our hearts. What do your words say about your heart? No, no, we're here in church, we're all great. We all know the right things to say. We can, we can use the right words. But, you know, what about Monday morning? What do your words say about your heart? What about Wednesday afternoon? What about Friday night? What do your words say about your heart? Do your words testify of your pure heart or your defiled heart? Are your words angry or are they forgiving? Are your words selfish or are they... 
helpful to other people? Are your words full of criticism and condemnation, or are they full of praise and affirmation? Are your words dripping with despair or overflowing with hope? What do your words say about your heart? And, and if you're not already sure, then I dare you to ask your spouse. We have marriage counseling available. It's okay. <laughs> ask your kids. If you have honest friends, ask them. Not the suck-up friends, the ones that just want you to buy them lunch. Ask the ones that'll tell you the truth. Now ask, you know, and, and if you're still like, I don't want to ask my friends and I'm not sure, then when was the last time you took God's name in vain? You see, Jesus said our words reveal our hearts. Does your heart pass the speech test? And, and finally, there's the desire test. The desire test. Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says, uh, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you're walking in the Spirit, if you allow the Holy Spirit to control you, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. The, the psalmist in Psalm 37 said, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If your delight is in God, he's going to give you the desires of your heart. So what is it that you desire? What do you dream about? What do you crave? What do you want? You know, is it money? Is it recognition? Is it respect? Is it more friends? Is it Jesus? It doesn't do any good to lie to yourself. God knows. It doesn't help you to lie to us because God knows. But if God gave you the desire of your heart today, what would it be? Because that tells you a lot about your heart. So how'd you do on the heart test? The pressure test, the celebration test, the speech test, the desire test. Well, if you're like me, um, you're not nearly as pure as you'd like to be. Not nearly as pure. Uh, you're, not, you're definitely not as pure as maybe as others think you are. Right? So, now... Here's the thing, whether you're a lifelong follower of Jesus who embarrassingly just failed the heart test or a lifelong reprobate who knew you were going to fail, what matters is what you do now. What matters is going forward. It doesn't matter because, you know, God's grace abounds to us. See, when I gave you this heart test, I knew we'd all fail. See, that's just it. Because the heart is, you know, it's deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. So, I, you know, it's kind of a, a setup. We all are going to fail. The question isn't, are we going to fail? The question is, what are you going to do now? And, and here's the thing. If you want the good life, if you want to live the good life, then listen to Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So do you want to see God? You guys are a lot less enthusiastic than you were at the beginning. <laughs> wow. Do you want to see God? Yeah. Okay, well, some of you, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> then let's talk about the pursuit of purity. The pursuit of purity. Jesus is saying, hey, look, if you have a pure heart, you're going to be blessed. And you're going to see things that other people don't see. You're going to see the miraculous. You're going to see the power of God. You're going to see the hand of God. Um, but here's the thing. We will never stumble into purity. It's never going to happen by accident. It's never going to be just something that just shows up. If you and I want a pure heart, then we have to intentionally pursue it. Now, every Christian I know affirms, at least publicly, the desire for purity. Now, in most of the churches I grew up in, that meant that you waited to have sex until you were married. That was it. You know, purity, uh, sexual purity, that's what they're talking about. But what Jesus is talking about way more than that. He's talking about holistic, whole life purity. Um, but here's the thing. Everyone affirms it, um, but it's a lot like the exercise equipment that we buy for our houses. Yeah, it just becomes a hanger for clothes. It doesn't do you any good just to talk about it. You actually have to pursue it. You have to want it. You have to be intentional about changing your life uh, in, in pursuit of purity. So this is going to take effort. Um, 
And I want to just talk to you about two decisions or actions that are required if you want a pure heart. Okay? You see, I said you want a pure heart, so here's two things you can do. You can leave t- tonight, and you can begin to do these, and you can say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop that pure heart. I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to develop that pure heart in me so that I can see things differently. The, the first thing that I want to challenge you to do is walk toward the light. Now, John chapter 3, Jesus said this. You guys know John chapter 3 a lot because it's got, you know, John three sixteen in it and everything. This is just after that. Verse 19, Jesus says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And we go again with that evil heart stuff. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. I'm going to show you something. Okay. There's the light. The light represents who? Jesus, yeah. Jesus said, hey, you know, this is what it means. If you walk toward the light, if you're in the light, then it shows that your works are of God. But if you're in the darkness, uh, then you don't want to be exposed, so you stay away from the light. So we were children of darkness. We lived in the darkness. By the way, if, if you're watching at home, it's dark on purpose, okay? Stay with us. Don't think that your TV just went blank. Look, we, li- we were children of darkness, And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, then you became children of light. But we hate the light because it exposes our deeds. So I'm kind of in the darkness, but the closer I walk to the light, then the brighter things get and the more I can see. But you know what? You guys can see me better in the light than in the darkness, can't you? Right, which means that you can see what I look like, and that means that I can't hide in the light. But in the darkness, I can hide. You don't see me clearly. And so what happens is we are sinners and so we like the darkness. We're addicted to the darkness. We want to stay in the darkness because when we walk in the light, we become aware of the filth on our hands. We become aware of the filth in our lives. And in that moment, as we approach the light of Christ, we've got two choices. We can repent of our sins or we can retreat into darkness because we don't want to have to repent of our sins. We walk into the light, we're either going to repent or retreat. If we repent, we confess our sins that we're aware of, and then we walk into the light, guess what we see? More of our sin, more of our filth. It becomes clearer to us, and we go, wow, I've got to repent again, or we're going to retreat into the darkness. And then we step further into the light until the light of Christ is shining us, and we see all of our flaws, we see all of our sin, we see all of our filth, and we repent and receive grace, or we run back into the darkness. You guys can turn the lights back on if you want to now. Um, It's not as easy as you guys think. This is complex. See, we were children of darkness, now we're children of light. But here's the choice you have to make. In your life today, are you walking toward the darkness, or are you walking toward the light? in the decisions that you make, in the way that you're living, in the associations that you have, in the places that you go, in the things that you see, are you walking toward the light or are you walking toward the darkness? Because every single decision that you make is taking you one direction or the other. It's taking you one direction or the other. Which way are you leaning? Because Jesus said it, we love darkness rather than light because our deeds are evil. And we don't want our deeds exposed. We don't want to have to repent. We don't want to have to say we're sorry. We don't want to have to confess again about our failure. So if Jesus has changed your life, he's calling you to walk in his light, into a life of transparency, into a life of repentance, into a life of surrender. So if you really were telling the truth when you said you wanted a pure heart, you wanted to see God, you have to pursue the light. Now, that's not just a one-time decision. You made it when you surrendered to Jesus. Okay, you said, uh, I'm pursuing the light. But you have to keep pursuing 
the light. You have to keep walking toward the light every single day. Oftentimes, multiple times throughout the day because we're faced with the desire to be in the darkness again. So walk toward the light. Second decision that you got to make if you want the pure heart is apply the truth filter. Apply the truth filter. How many of you have water at your house? Okay, pretty simple question. If you have a residence, you have water. How many of you drink the tap water at your house? There's like eight people. What is wrong with you people? Why would you drink the Havasu tap water? I mean, the Havasu tap water is disgusting, right? We all, you know, we got, and what do we do? We put a filter on the water. It's called an RO system, and so we can actually drink the water from our houses, right? Or we buy bottled water, that's expensive, and so you can drink the water. But we don't drink the tap water because it's disgusting. We put that filter to filter out all the stuff that makes it disgusting so we can drink it. Um, Our hearts are deceitful and wicked. Our culture constantly is feeding us lies and lust and envy and greed and pride and we need to filter the nasty stuff out. If you don't make any effort, then the nasty stuff's gonna get in your heart and it's gonna poison you. And your heart's not gonna be pure. So how do you apply the truth filter? Well, the first thing you need to do is read, study, and memorize scripture. I don't know if these are in your notes or not, but you probably ought to write it down. Read, study, and memorize scripture. Uh, Jesus said in John 8, if you remain in my word, talking about the Bible, if you remain in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Everybody loves that last half of that verse, right? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. How do you know the truth? By remaining in Jesus' words. That's how, that's the only way you know the truth is remaining in Jesus' words. In other words, uh, the Bible, you have to know the truth in order to filter the lies. And you know what our problem is? We don't know the truth. We're familiar with the truth. We know parts of the truth, but but we're honestly, you know, not students of this word enough to know the lies of Satan, and he leads us into destruction because we are easily deceived because we don't know the truth, which is why we always encourage you to take a Bible and read the Bible because if you read and apply God's word, God will change your life. But I'm just telling you, if you don't know the truth, then you are captive to the lies. It is your filter for your soul for what goes in and what is true and isn't true. So read, study, and memorize scripture. It is truth. And then if you want to apply the truth filter, not only do you need to read, study, and memorize scripture, but you need to limit the filth in your life and in the life of your family. You have to take action to limit the filth in your life and in the life of your family. And and that means, just being really blunt, you need to turn off the fire hose of filth from the world into your household and into your lives. You just need to turn it off. What does that mean? Well, I mean, for pastors on staff at Calvary, we have accountability software on our devices, which means computers, phones, tablets. Why? Because we want to be accountable. And it's a whole lot easier to say no to temptation when you know your friends are going to see what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got kids at home, you need to have accountability software and a filter on the internet for their phones and your phones and for the tablets and your tablets and for the computers and for the gaming systems. Some of you are like, the gaming systems? Yes, they have access to the internet. They have access to pornography. Oh, my kids wouldn't do that. The average age of exposure to hardcore pornography now is 12. 12. 12. Parents, you've got a heavy responsibility, a heavy burden. And, 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 and I know we all go, yeah, that's tragic, and, but it won't happen to us. You know, we offered uh, through CCA in partnership with Calvary, we had all these training classes on how to protect your kids from, you know, internet stalking and pornography and bullying and all that kind of stuff. And like maybe a dozen families showed up out of the hundreds of families in this community. We just don't take it seriously. Well, okay. Part of the reason is because, let's just be honest, if we put filters on our internet, then we'll have to stop looking at porn too. Oh, wait, did I say that out loud? Yeah, I did. 
Hey, why do we have, why do we pay for a smut TV? I mean, honestly, I mean, we're, we're taking our money and we're, and we're giving it to Satan. Why, I mean, okay, so I'll, I'll just play unfair. I've already gone here. If I looked at your Netflix history, would you be embarrassed? I, I mean, I had to think about that when I wrote this down. I was like, oh, would I be embarrassed? Yeah, because I watched some dorky movies. But um, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. If you want a pure heart, then guard your heart from the filth in your life and in your family's life. Parents, don't let your kids take their devices into their rooms alone. Uh, you, you're the only one who can protect them. They, they're not smart enough to protect themselves. Grandparents, don't be naive. Uh, and here's the payout. Look, if we apply this truth filter, if we walk toward the light, then we're gonna see God's handiwork and we're gonna recognize God's redeeming love in our lives and in the lives of others. And we're gonna become more aware of his presence because blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Um, this week, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, uh, there's been reports about uh, a revival outbreak in Asbury, Kentucky, at the college there. And I've been watching the posts, and people are excited about, hey, this is cool, it's happening, and it is exciting. And I think it's real, and I think it's encouraging, and I, I am praying that it would expand and, and grow. But I've also listened to a lot of people in the Christian community go, oh, I want to go to it, I want to go see it, I want to experience it. Which is cool, if you've got time and you've got money to go do that, then, then awesome, tell us all about it. But but one of the things I know for us is that we're addicted to experiences. We want to go experience the coolest thing. If you know Jesus, then you have the power of God that is at work in those revivals among college students. In your life, right now. Same power of God. And I'm just going to tell you, if you want to experience God's presence and power like never before, pursue a pure heart. Don't just talk about it, do it. Pursue, chase, work for a pure heart because then you'll see God and you'll feel his power and you'll taste his goodness in your life in the same way that's happening at those revivals. And who knows, maybe God will even do something like that here. Let's pray. Father, we are helpless apart from you. And God, you know our lives and you know our hearts. We can't hide the filth. We can't hide the deceits that we're buying into. We can't hide the lies that we live by. So what we invite you to do is speak truth into us today. God, we yield to you. You're our Savior. You're our Lord. You're our King. You're our Master. And we want you to change us. So we invite your Holy Spirit to move in power, in conviction, and God, we'll stop hiding in the darkness and we'll stop retreating into the darkness and we will step into the light. We will repent and we will invite you to change us because we really do want to see you and we want to taste your goodness and we want to experience your power like never before. So we simply invite you to do your work because you are able. In Jesus' name, amen.